Welcome to the second episode of Real Squawk Bird Keeping Conversations. My name is Tiffany. I am joined by Jason, Lisa, and Jordan. And in episode two today, we're going to talk about how we all started, sure, you know, what brought us into keeping birds, what got us interested in um, birds, and also the top five considerations for bird ownership in our point of view. So I will start. Um, again, my name is Tiffany. I have had birds since I was a young child. My very first bird was a blue budgie. When I was two years old, it was my birthday present. Um, his name was Blue, Bluey, very original. And when he passed away, I ended up getting my first cockatiel. And my cockatiel's name was Peanut. And I had Peanut until pretty much I was in my sophomore year of college. And when Peanut passed away, I, I knew I wanted to keep having birds, but I was in kind of the very throes of my biology degree. And I knew I didn't have the time and energy to really be kind of hands-on with a bird. I knew I still wanted to have a bird, but I didn't want something that was going to require kind of the day-to-day -day interaction and time that a pet would have. And I went into Carol's Critters in Tallahassee and there was a pair of Gouldians there. And I saw them doing their little mating ritual, which if you've ever seen it is the most ridiculous thing aside from maybe blue cap corn blues. And I thought, oh my gosh, these things are beautiful and they're silly. I love them. I bought them. I got them home and I had no intention on breeding them whatsoever. And then I graduated and I kind of started looking into the mutations and I got really fascinated and interested in them and kind of Pringles after that. I just could not stop. I got more and more and more and I got more interested into it. Um, I started to become really interested in the genetics and sort of trying to understand how the various genetic mutations worked. Things that I focused on was that there was no documentation of uh, identifying actual babies in the nest. So I wanted to be able to look at a nest of Gouldians and know, okay, this one's yellow, this one's normal, this one's blue. And there was nothing like that out there. So I began photo documenting everything. I took pictures of everything. I invested in a DSLR camera and I started documenting, noting differences, writing everything down. At that same time, I was uh, the membership director for a national bench and soft skill society. And I wrote a few articles um, you know, with my photos, kind of documenting everything that I had learned. I started showing my birds back then as well. And from there, I was kind of working and breeding them and showing them. And uh, I entered. Back down to Florida, I kind of took a turn and decided that I wanted to go more into the hookville route. So I got a pair of green sheet conures. And my homeowners association quickly decided that me having those on my lanai was um, not going to work. So I ended up trading them for my first pair of parrotlets and they kind of created a new obsession for me. Um, whereas I had been completely 100% obsessed with the Gouldian finches, now I am 100% obsessed with the parrotlets. And then I ended up getting kakarikis. They're a new you know, uh, a new additional obsession. And then now I also have red rumps and the Sierras. And that's kind of how I got started. I've had birds my whole life and I just kind of have graduated into hand feeding and having the little cutie pies that I have that you can see there. Beautiful. I love the blue. He's a turquoise, but yes, he's beautiful. Oh, oh, whoa, <laughs> excuse me. <No. laughs> but you know what, I, I hey, love for, for, so, for somebody that doesn't know, I mean, you know, thank you for correcting me because I would have not, I wouldn't have known, so. <laughs> yeah, I, I love um, how people get really angry when you use the wrong terms for mutations. I'm like, calm down, it's okay. <laughs> like, we, we all, we all yeah. know where we're going. Yeah. I, say, I say that yeah. a little bit in jest because I feel like there is that sort of weird desire for people to constantly correct others. And, you know, it's kind of yeah. like, it, it doesn't, yeah. it's, there, it's not doing anyone any harm, but. Right. 
Yeah, I'm the, I'm the same way when it comes to Lori, so. <laughs> So who's next? Uh, I can go next. Alrighty, so these are um, some of my birds and uh, the picture at the top, the top left um, are some babies I raised last year. So I primarily work with um, lorries and I've always loved birds throughout my life. My grandmother always kept them and she basically raised me when I was a toddler. She always had um, budgies, canaries, finches, and stuff like that. At one point, I think they reproduced for her, but she wasn't she wasn't like a breeder. She wasn't trying to, you know, breed them. And um, I remember just being so into them. And um, it's just it's just something that's kind of weird to describe because it's almost like it's in ingrained in your mind you know and who you are as a person it's a passion and I've I've always had birds it it, it always annoyed my parents because I would always ask for a bird as a pet you know and um I kept I've I've kept budgies love birds cockatiels all of that um in uh, my early teens and at one point my father helped me uh build um, or construct a, a walk-in aviary. It was nothing too fancy. So it was in my early teens and I kept a bunch of budgies together and they some of them reproduced for me. And I was just so ecstatic and, and excited about that, you know. Um, and then uh, fast forward to the age of 18, 19, I moved away from home. I didn't keep birds at all. And um, I did have some here and there, but I sold them before I left and moved away from home. And um, I just kind of felt sort of sort of empty, like like something was missing. Um, and I ended up moving back home because my grandparents um, were were uh, sick. They got sick, and um, you know they were older, and they had more health issues as they aged. But um, so I was taking care of them and they allowed me to kind of get back into it and keep birds at their place. So I got in, I, I started to look for more of the, ex, you know, exotic stuff. And I had, it just, it just, I opened a door basically to where I am now. And I would look for, for birds that were for sale and I would try to contact anybody and everybody I could you know, searching for people online. I, I cannot remember the website, but there was a certain website, a directory that had a bunch of people's names and who what, what they bred and what they worked with. And I got into um, Australian broadtails at one point. I had a pair of eclectus at one point. I had African greys and nothing ever, you know, they're beautiful birds, but they didn't feel, they didn't feel like they were right for me. And I don't mean that in, you know, like they're worthless or anything like that. I mean, they're, they're awesome birds. Um, but I came across um, a pair of rainbow lorikeets um, at a bird fair and I fell in love and that's um, basically the lorry bug bit me and I started to dive deeper into um, the group that that specific group of parrots as a, you know, as a whole. And I remember just Googling stuff and looking at pictures online and just being awed by how beautiful these birds were and how diverse they are in color and in shape and size. Um, so yeah, I mean, over the last 10 years, um, I have about 30 pairs now um, of lorries. And um, if, if you were to tell me 10 years ago that I would have what I have, I wouldn't have believed it at all, you know, and um, I was very fortunate to have supportive parents and a supportive partner that um, allows me to do what I love doing with these, with these birds. So. Did you find it difficult yep. to make connections when you discovered that you were interested in that species? Like, did you have any challenges? Um, even when, if it, even when it was with other species I had or kept at that time, um, it was it was challenging because a lot of those people were were older, and um, they were either um, 
sick and, you know, being ready to pass, um, or they were just up in age and getting out and getting at, um, out of everything. Um, so I learned what I could from them, but it was difficult to, it was definitely difficult to source birds. And even with lorries, um, it was, it was really, really hard, um, to, to find, you know, to just find somebody to not pay attention to me, but kind of just, you know, give me the time of day, you know, as far as it, as far as, um, their care and, um, you know, what I could do as far as breeding and stuff like that. And, um, you know, as far as a mentor goes, Chris, uh, Chris Touchton in Florida, I consider her my mentor, basically. Mm -hmm. Um, it's funny because I think back in 2011 or 2012, something like that, I sent my first email to her and I came across her website online and I asked if she had any lorries for sale. Granted, I had never kept them and I asked if she had them for sale and um, I got a short response in return, you know, and now looking back, it's, it's, it, it kind of makes sense why, you know, she, she, uh, kind of was short with me um I was younger I'm you know we get a lot of people all the time that are interested but never really do anything and so it's like mm, who is this person you know are, are they serious about this or are they just you know uh fooling around or something like that so um there was definitely information online but a lot of that information is conflicted you know um so, yeah, I guess if that answers your question, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, they're wonderful, wonderful birds. And what's, what do you think is the biggest challenge that people don't foresee when they want to get into lorries and lorikeets? Um, I want to say the diet. So I would say the diet is number one and number two is actually sourcing sourcing uh, different species besides the rainbow species. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of what I have today um, is just not, it's not around at all. You know, people do have them, but it's only a small handful of people. And those, that group of people kind of, um, they just work with each other versus selling off, like let's take uh, blue streaks, for example. I wouldn't sell a pair of blue streaks or, or even young uh, young birds, babies to someone who is just starting out. Like, there's no way that I would do that, you know. Um, so yeah. And what do what do people tend to? Um, what mistakes do people tend to make with the diet? Um, they so like I mentioned in in the the first uh, episode. Um, they think that they can either eat seed or a complete dry powder diet, which m some species like take the rainbow as an example, they can tolerate that stuff and they, you know, they can eat it. But when it comes to other species like blue crown lorries and Stella's and stuff like that, an all dry diet will not suffice. Um, mm -hmm. they, they need a lot of moisture in their diet. Um, I did feed, um, when I was starting out, I did feed pellets and dry powder at one point. And even with the pellets, you know, when I bought my first pair, they wanted nothing to do with the pellets at all, you know? So, so yeah, people try to sol solidify their droppings because they're messy. And really why you're doing the bird a disservice by doing that, you know, why, why work with the species that you're just going to be annoyed by or, <laughs> or be overwhelmed by, you know? So, yes. Yeah, because I found even with some of the species I raised, you know, they'll ask, they'll keep asking people the same questions until they hear an answer that they want. And I know that diet right. is a, a major problem with that. Like they, mm -hmm. they want it to be simple, but there is nothing simple about feeding birds, right? We can streamline right. it, right. but it is, it is difficult. So yeah. And I know lorries and lorikeets are, are highly specialized to begin with. Yes, cool. yeah, absolutely. Yep. So Jordan, did they really ignore the pellets or did they play with the pellets? Um, they ignored them actually. 
Good. Um, so they, <laughs> they did not. That actually surprises me. I would they, picture them flinging them everywhere. <laughs> you know, and you do have, um, you do have, for example, I sold, I just sold a, ba a baby to someone um, last week and um, they have a, uh, they do have an existing lorry and that bird only eats pellets because that's what they were raised on. You do have birds that have only ever been fed one way and they're addicted or they don't, they refuse change. So they continue to feed the pellets, but you have to try to implement something, whether it be fruit and nectar or something to get them to catch their attention and be curious to, to try it out. So, yeah. I feel like I might have been getting with Chris Tetchin at a similar time that you were first communicating with her because I got a black lorry from her in, I was in Maryland and I wasn't in Bethesda yet. So I was, it was when I was in Pasadena and I got a black lorry from her. Mm -hmm. um, and it was either right before or right after I actually got the white back to mouse bird from you, Jason. So I had Critter, who was the white back to mouse bird and I Merlin, who was the Black Lori at the same time. And then other people know this, but I had a huge collection. So I had probably somewhere around 100 show quality Gouldian finches. I had red billed fire finches. I had quarter on blues. I had shaft tails. And I had, um, um, I had some like, I don't want to say show quality society finches, but I had some really nice European line society finches. And I had a personal situation happen where I had to sell everything. So I had to mm -hmm. move out of my house that I was living in. I had to sell everything. I could only take about five birds with me in a small cage. So I ended mm -hmm. up taking my five favorite Gouldian finches. Like two of them are actually on my little cup here. Um, I took five Gouldian finches with me to my apartment that I had to move into in Bethesda. I took my dog mm -hmm. Halo, who I still have. She's immortal. I don't think she's ever going to die. And then I took my cat. I was in a rent controlled apartment and I could only have one pet. So anytime I had maintenance come, I had to wheel the cage into the bathroom and hide it. I had to like, <laughs> chew my cat away. Um, so I lost everything. And when I moved back to Florida, that was my opportunity to kind of rebuild and you know I see a lot of I see a lot of times where people kind of struggle with getting started and I think about myself mm -hmm. and how I had to give up everything that I built for what was that I mean 2003 until 2012 I, I had yeah. to give up nine years worth of work and I right. started all over again in 2014 but it's you know if it's something that you love and it's something that you're passionate about oh. you can do it <laughs> Yeah. I just thought about that because I, I was like, oh my gosh, I, I was probably talking to her around the exact same time that you were. Yeah, I can. And I can tell you, uh, you know, more times than I can count, my mom told me, do not bring any more birds home. And I did not listen at all, you know. Um, so it's kind of like you keep throwing the wet paper towel to the wall, you know, until it sticks. And, you know, she, she knew it was it. It's, uh, you know, it's what I love doing and I'm not going to stop, you know, and, and I was very fortunate enough to just have parents that realized that and, and, you know, were supportive and not everybody has family like that or a partner like that. Not everybody's situation is the same, you know, I mean, I can, I can only imagine what Tiffany went through, you know, losing everything and having to downsize to that many birds because of her situation yet look at where she is today you know and just with any of us so yeah but yeah I love you Lori's. can do it <laughs> right. who's next Lisa Lisa sorry had to unmute there <laughs> so I probably the only one in the group that didn't grow up loving birds. Um, I was a crazy cat person um, <laughs> until, oh, sometime in the late 90s. I was in my mid-30s. My first two kids, my daughter was, my youngest daughter was, or my oldest daughter, I'm sorry, was around six and my son was four. 
And I went to a friend's house to watch a hockey game. And her dad had found a cockatiel up in a tree. And he had tried to find a home, left signs everywhere, contacted stores. And it had been about a week and nobody was responding. So he was going to take the bird uh, over to the Denver Dumb Friends Lake, which is a, a shelter here in Colorado. And so I said, well, you know, hold on a minute. Let me call my husband because we love animals. You know, we probably had everything except a bird. So uh, he was, uh, my husband's a firefighter. He was on shift at the time. And I called him at the fire station and I said, um, so Heidi's dad has this cockatiel and it needs a home. And he's like, so what do you feed a cockatiel? I don't know, seed? Ritz crackers and wheat. Crack <laughs> yeah, Ritz crackers. <laughs> and he's like, well, what would we keep it in? I don't know. I guess I could stop and get a cage. So I ended up taking this cockatiel home, stopped at Walmart on my way home, bought a cockatiel set up in some Walmart seed <laughs> and <laughs> took him home. And we spent the entire evening trying to get this cockatiel out of this cat carrier because we had no experience at all. And, you know, he was terrifying. He was hissing and doing angry cockatiel things. And my husband actually even ended up naming him Queequeg, who's the cannibal in Moby Dick, because <laughs> he took a couple of chunks out of us before we got him out. Um, but the thing that surprised me was how affectionate he was, how smart he was. And I mean, it was just out of left field, but uh, I just... That, that was it. I mean, when our last cat died, that was it for cats for me. And uh, we ended up getting a little Quaker parrot a few, about six months after that. Uh, somebody needed a home. So we brought him home and uh, he fell in love with my oldest daughter. My oldest daughter grew up with him. And uh, then it kind of was just the, the cockatiel and the Quaker parrot for quite a long time. Till about 2008, I worked with a guy, had an eclectus, female eclectus parrot, and he needed uh, someone to babysit her. So we ended up babysitting her, and then he decided he didn't want to take her back again. He was moving. She fell in love with my youngest daughter, who's Is in that the picture? Yeah, yeah. that's my youngest, Linnea, <laughs> and they just fell in love with each other. And uh, then about... A year later, another friend asked me to babysit her green wing macaw, and we ended up. She again, she didn't want. She didn't want to take her back. We ended up keeping her. And then in 2010, I volunteered at my first parrot rescue, and yeah, that was it. It just <laughs> it just went downhill from there. <laughs> um, it was, that's uh, the picture on the left there is uh, when I was working for the Gabriel Foundation in Colorado. And there are just so many species, so many, oh my God, so many different birds, you know? And uh, I just ended up, you know, adopting here, adopting there and left there, uh, started another parrot rescue and uh, worked there for a while. Um, and then there was some fallout there, started helping another friend who had a parrot rescue, uh, some issues there. And then my friend Sharice and I, who uh, both worked at the Gabriel Foundation together, started Rocky Mountain Parrot. And that is our uh, parrot welfare organization that uh, we decided to do a little bit differently. Wanted to really be able to work with others in the bird community, uh, particularly with breeders, because we both feel that when you have bred a species for a long time, you have a lot of information that's really valuable. And uh, one of the things that I was seeing with a lot of rescues is kind of a one size fits all with parrots. And as we know, that's not the case. Uh, we screwed up with eclectus parrots for a very long time, uh, primarily with diet. Uh, I think we're doing the same with African greys now. And 
you know, if, if you want to get good information on some of these species, if you really care about these birds the way that we say that we do, then we need to work with each other. We need to listen to breeders and, you know, breeders probably would love to know what's going on in the rescue community, but the, absolutely the fighting and the uh, name calling and uh, the breeder bashing has always just stuck around cord with me. So, right. so hopefully, that, hopefully that's on the way to changing. So I have a question, actually. I think I know the answer for Jordan. And obviously, like Jason, I know you, you have a full-time job too. I have a full-time job. But like Lisa and Jordan, do you guys have full-time jobs or do you do, does, does the bird side of it kind of like encompass your, um, your main, you know, career? Mm -hmm. I work full-time, um, um, yeah. Um, I, I do not. So my, um, I'm, I'm basically fortunate enough to uh, be able to do the, the birds full time. Um, and I don't know how to properly, uh, phrase it or say it, but what I might, what I mean by that is I do enough to be able to support m what I'm doing here. So that goes back into the birds, um, and provides what I need in order to ensure that, um, my birds are well taken care of. So uh, when, I, when I was in California um, a year ago, I, w I was working and I, I did do um, graveyard shifts. Um, I was a care provider slash uh, nurse assistant. So I would uh, go to work at night for eight to 12 hours, come home, feed babies, nap for two to three hours, get up, do it all over again, feed everything outside. Uh, go to the gym, come back home, eat, um, and get ready for my, get, get ready for my next shift. And the, you know, cause I, I don't hand feed it, uh, feed anything, um, uh, you know, all night long. I don't. So I would feed, um, I would feed whatever babies I had right before my shift started. And then because I got off early enough, as soon as I got home, I would feed them again. So, um, yeah, I, I basically always kept a job where I had an open schedule and it, it, it was my schedule. Like I made my schedule and, you know, because I wanted to focus on the birds, I made sure that I was able to do that. So I was able to take care of everything. So, and then now that I'm here in Texas, um, you know, we're, we're, we're just in, in a, in a good position where, you know, my partner, um, my partner's a firefighter slash paramedic. So he goes to work, um, for, for two days, comes back home for two days and he helps me out with whatever I need here as far as the animals and the birds. So, um, we work together well, basically. Sure. I was just curious. I just, I felt like it was important to note that, you know, you don't, not everybody is doing this successfully and is, only doing this um oh yeah yeah there's no way you're going to be filthy rich off of breeding you know <laughs> because you're I mean, I'm you're definitely not, definitely yeah, not. That, you know and um what it costs to feed the birds alone i mean especially nowadays where you have inflation inflation is an issue and everything is going up in cost the price of birds is going up so really where is where's the profit margin you know where's it at so um, yeah, and whatever money we do make as breeders, really, I will use that money to get whatever else I want to work with. So. Yeah, I feel like I'm constantly investing back into the birds. So whether it's upgrading my existing enclosures or cages, whatever you want to call it, or, um, you know, I go through a period of time where I'm switching out their perches and making sure that I have enough toys. I know I do toys in my mm -hmm. breeder cages. I know that's not a thing for everybody, but, um, you know, I'm buying toys constantly or I'm investing in the paper that I have, like the big rolls of paper that I use to line the cages with. And I feel like it's, mm -hmm. it's always, it's a circular investment. I, 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 I tell people constantly, cause that's, you know, that I feel like that's the, the common theme, right. Is how 
how can I get into this? What, what kind of return on investment am I going to see? It's, mm-hmm. it, for me, it's kind of like, I think if you are in it for the right reasons, that's not really, it's not really everything, anything I've ever really thought about. It's more like, I think of it in a way where if I'm, if I've had a good year, my first thought is, well, what species can I invest in to work with this year? And I, I feel like other people might see that as kind of, I don't know, like you're like, um, like it's not, pro- I don't want to say it's not profitable, but you're, yeah, maybe it's not, but it's, it's kind of like, I, I just want to constantly put back into that passion and I constantly want to be doing better and what can I do to improve and mm-hmm. you know, oh, yeah, what it's... new things can I, can I bring in and what new things can I work with? Yeah. It's just always exciting to me. There's always something new to do. <laughs> it's a blessing and a curse because yes. it's a blessing, a blessing that you get to work with such, you know, beautiful birds, but a curse because you're always putting money into something, especially when something happens, you know? So, yeah, but yeah. I do have a question for Lisa too. <laughs> yes. Um, so Lisa, was there, was there a point um, in your life specifically when you were doing, uh, you know, well, you still are doing the uh, parrot welfare th- uh, thing, but I guess call it the rescue thing. So was there a point in your life where you, where you did not like breeders or you believed these things that people said about breeders or the specific community or group of people? No, there really wasn't. Um, I think that part of it was we had bought dogs from breeders before. Um, Mm -hmm. Our first boxer we bought was from kind of a backyard breeder and he died at six from cancer. So the next boxer that we bought, we found a breeder who had worked for years to breed cancer out of boxers because they're very susceptible to that. And Uh, She lived a nice long life. And I think that when I was doing the research on getting our boxer and finding out all the things that went into making sure that these dogs were healthy, I had a good um, idea of what was involved with breeding and that it wasn't just something that, you know, people are, I don't know any breeder that's getting rich off of breeding anything. Um, And then, and when I started at the first rescue, you know, that was kind of the uh, talk, you know, that you don't want to buy from breeders and, um, you know, breeders are terrible. Breeders are part of the problem, blah, blah, blah. But uh, at the same time that I had started there, we got my son's first little lovebird from a breeder in Colorado and she was wonderful and it was a great experience. And I saw how much time and care went into her babies and um so it just never <clears throat> it was something that never sat well with me no mm-hmm. I, I that that definitely yeah. was I was not the norm for that but um mm-hmm. yeah and then that feeling yeah. just, just grew as as the years went on yeah and a lot of people don't realize that breeders and and uh you know the rescue mantra whatever you want to call them actually have a lot of things in common when it comes to birds because we the both both sides love birds you know so yeah i i think it's great when both sides can work together because ultimately we want to we we want to we obviously want to keep them you know and um especially when it comes to saving a species from completely disappearing here, you know, in U.S. aviculture. So, yeah. Yeah. But I was just curious. We can always do better when we work together than when we're spending a bunch of energy fighting with each other, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, and I think, I mean, when, when I talk about the science of aviculture, so much of what we know today is because of the large sample sizes that only breeders have. And Mm -hmm. they've taught us, because birds just don't mate. Like you can't throw two birds together and then they do it. Like that's just Mm -hmm. not how it works. (laughs) Um, 
and it's it's difficult it's it can be very very difficult depending on the species but it's, it's difficult all around and what i think a lot of newer people to aviculture learn is that you can't cut corners mm-hmm. because it won't work the birds are going to do what they're going to do or they're not going to do it because you're cutting corners and they learn that way um yeah and and you know lisa and i have talked about this before um where i've been in really great rehoming centers and i've been in abysmal horrible Mm -hmm. conditions right right and what's better for the birds the biological imperative is to pass on your genes if you are an animal plant whatever doesn't matter the biological imperative is to pass on your genes this is what all animals are built to do and Mm -hmm. um depriving birds of that when they could be in that situation i find to be cruel and so am i saying that pets should be breeding no because they're if they're being kept properly they're getting they're they're getting their needs met right Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but to say that it's cruel to breed birds is is resoundingly false there is absolutely no science to prove that and most people who make these really extreme absolute claims have never done it before breeding Mm -hmm. you know breeding birds and things like that they've never been in this situation and so um and it was funny because i was talking when i first met bonnie zimmerman from the indonesian parrot project and if you don't follow them you need to amazing conservation work Eclectus lorries, cockatoos, just really, really amazing work getting these birds out of the black market in Indonesia and reintroducing them to the wild. Really, really vital, critical work. And she told me, she's like, if I didn't breed birds, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. She goes, I learned so much about birds by breeding Mm -hmm. them, watching their behavior, hand rearing them, learning about their anatomy, like all of that comes with the territory. And so, you know, when, when we work together, it just is the birds are going to benefit and that's all there is to it. Right. Well, I, and I don't know about all about, about each of you, but I almost feel like that experience of working with them makes my love for them and my passion grow. So, you know, learning something new or engaging with people like you, I mean, it just makes me feel even more, I guess, kind of like m- just not justified, but maybe even like validated um, mm-hmm. that like my work and what I'm doing is important. And right. it, it makes me, if it, it makes me feel fulfilled, that's what I'm trying to say. Like I, I get, I get that fulfillment from learning something or witnessing something new or seeing a breakthrough, you know, with, with diet mm-hmm. or um, with changing something up, like the, these new nest boxes that I got, I, I, th- that's exciting for me. It's enriching. It's, it's enriching for me. It's fulfilling for me. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely, <laughs> it's very reassuring to knowing that there are people um, with the same mentality that Lisa has, you know, that we should be working mm-hmm. together, you know, um, to ensure that these birds just don't disappear, you know, at all. And, um, you know, I, education is super important too whether it's you know um a family walking into you know a rehoming facility or rescue whatever you want to call it and you know that whatever child they have with them is infatuated by whatever they see you know they that like it's kind of like take our experiences as children and how we grew up and how we fell in love with birds you know a kid going into a rescue or a kid walking into a breeder's facility can both equally fall in love with, with birds, you know? So yeah, it's, um, there's definitely a lot of stigma behind both, both parties. So I think it's very important to kind of bridge the gap between the two. So, uh, Jason, you're saying that you can't force birds to breed? (laughs) <laughs> if only it was that easy right i mean oh, when, when you look at when you look at zoo programs and you know other conservation institutions um the the science that's being done is astounding i mean it really is um when you look at the success 
that zoos have with different species and you know keeping keeping animals especially birds is a scientific experiment that never ends right we're constantly testing and changing variables in the environment to see what those animals are going to respond to in a positive way and um, one of the courses I teach at the university is zoo biology and I had Dr. Jessica Whittem on yesterday, who's an animal welfare specialist. She works through the Chicago Zoological Society. And she talks about all of the research projects that are constantly going on that people just don't even know about at zoos. And you know, every time someone says, oh, zoos are prisons, I'm like, you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about. You really don't. Like, You need to understand what we're doing for animals, why they live so much longer in zoos than in the wild, what how much of the wild is actually left for these animals. Mm -hmm. um, there's just some biological scientific truths out there that are convenient to ignore when you have an ax to grind, right? Or an agenda. So, yeah. um, you know, li listening to people like that and then talking to breeders who are in private aviculture and the species that they're working with and why they're working with those species and what they have discovered about the species. You know, uh, Tiffany and I are part of a little consortium that's raising Sierra parakeets, which are not common. I, I know of five people that have them. I mean, they're just not that common. And um, to, to listen to what um, we work with a, a, a guy, a breeder named Mark, and to listen to what he's discovered by observing these birds, trying different things, and the success he has had is is just unparalleled and those are the things that we need to be um, talking about among amongst ourselves you know um the birds i breed are not common they don't end up in in rehoming situations and if they do they come back to me um mm -hmm. and you know it and that's costly for me because i have to i have to test them because i have no idea what they've been exposed to a lot of the times they need to be vetted because they've been fed incorrect things. No matter how much education I can possibly do, some some just don't listen, right? Or they listen to somebody else and they give them, mm -hmm. you know, poor information. But, you know, all of those things are, um, are things that we just have to keep having a dialogue around so that we, we can figure out what, what, what best practice is. Absolutely. And if we can rub two birds together and make more make more bird, you let me know how to do that. <laughs> don't you think we'd all be, do don't, you, don't you think we'd all be rich at that point if that was yeah was yeah that then, easy? then maybe there'd be a profit. Um, and I'm right. not against profit as long as the birds are very well cared for and and you yeah. know and, and are uh, kept in a great environment, yeah. which we can all say. But I think there's way too much judgment out there, and I think that's one of the problems in, in aviculture regardless of where you're at is it's really easy to celebrate and share successes but it's really hard to share failures and when it oh, comes yeah. to failures, oh 100 nobody on here is going to judge me for a failure right they're going to no. you're going to support me you're going to help me um you're going to you know i'm going to i'm going to ask questions and things like that we're all learning here to better the you know for the betterment of the the, the animals that we keep the birds that we keep um, right but social media is a pretty strange animal where it's real easy to judge from behind a keyboard and you know every time someone I see somebody judging someone else rather harshly I just want to go I just want to go to their house and say I'm gonna I can find 10 things that you're doing that I disagree with because that's mm -hmm. exactly what you're doing to someone sight unseen right so we need to be a lot kinder to each other or we're not going to teach anybody you never win anybody over by making them look bad yeah. Well, and how how can you ever really truly learn if you're never sharing any of your failures to begin with? Because everybody is going to make a mistake along the way, and there's no such thing as perfection. There's no such thing as going. Like you said it's it's a constant, nonstop experiment. If someone has if someone has the ability to purchase a species and put them in a cage and get brilliant results with every single thing they work with, then they have a in touch and they should really capitalize on that yeah. because yeah. I haven't, I, even with Goulding and Finches, like I haven't, I haven't worked with a single bird. I haven't had to take a step back and say, what could I do differently? Or what could I do better? Or mm -hmm. what am I, 
you know, what's lacking or what's, what's going on? Because it's never the bird's fault. It's always going to be something on me. What am I doing wrong? What do I need to change? Because their environment is controlled by me. So if something isn't Mm -hmm. working and if something isn't right, then it's something I need to look at and address. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. And like I said, it's an experiment that never ends. Um, and I'll, I'll, I forgot, I probably need to take hey, my you time. Gone yet. Um, but <laughs> um, I started breeding birds when I was 12. I got one cockatiel because my neighbor got one. And I just was so taken with its intelligence. It was the first bird I had ever really interacted from my grandmother's canary, which didn't do anything. Um, except lay eggs. It was supposed to be a boy, never ended up being boy. Um, and I, I just remember it laying an egg in its seed dish and sitting there going, yeah, it's not a boy. Um, but I got my first cockatiel and then I got a second cockatiel. And then you can probably guess what happened next. I got, they had babies and I had many more cockatiels. Um, and I was, this was before the internet. So, you know, I didn't have mentors. I didn't have resources. I had some books that I ravenously tore through and read everything that I possibly could. Um, and if any of you go back and look at some of those books, you know, they're wrought with misinformation. (laughs) Um, Most of it came from the 1960s when, you know, everybody was just feeding sunflower seeds and expecting, you know, miracles. Um, I started, because of that love for for birds, I started working in local pet shops when I was in high school. um, And I did that through um, college. And, um, you know, always having some birds, uh, you know, breeding and um, some, you know, and also some pets. Uh, I started vet school and decided, you know, I I never really wanted to do that at at any point. Um, So I decided to uh, leave vet school and go to uh, get my certification to teach biology and animal science. And so um, I started teaching biology and animal science, um, had a room full of birds, had a room, a greenhouse full of plants, so live things all around me, and really started um, empowering students to work with uh, these animals. Um, I continued to breed hookbills, especially cockatiels and lineulated parakeets that I brought over from Europe in the early 2000s. Big, beautiful birds um, that were just perfect. Uh, They were robust and breeding in their quarantine cages. (laughs) They just were were really healthy and, and um, it was a great experience. And um, I got my first soft bills around that time uh, with the green arasaris. And that's what's perched on my head um, in that top picture there. Um, and I started, I, I had a pet named Cricket that I used in education programs. And um, because, of, because of her, I met Dr. Karen Becker, who I'm pictured with in the center in the, the bottom there. Now, Dr. Becker back then um, had just started practicing in the Chicago area. Um, she was exotic. So it was, I was like, finally, there's, you know, I have a vet who probably will understand what I'm doing. <laughs> and um, my, my uh, first RSRE came down with iron storage disease. And that is really when we started looking at diet because I was told low iron pellets. Um, I was told low iron, low iron pellets are going to take care of everything. And need. And I still had a bird with hemochromatosis, iron storage disease. So um, Mm -hmm. doctor through Dr. Becker's treatment of that and removing the pellets from the diet, we kept her alive three and a half years beyond her diagnosis, which is really unheard of. Um, And so I think she was uh, 18 when she passed. So that was pretty old for a green heart. Sorry. Um, I started, um, I added an addition to my home. (laughs) I got a home equity loan and what did I do? I built, I built a bird room, which was basically a four season room, a big long room with misters, windows all the way around, skylights, um, because I wanted to give them as much natural light as I possibly could um, year round and then have all these windows open um, in, the, in the summer months. And um, it must've worked because I, uh, one day when I was feeding, I got attacked by one of the, the hens, my green RSRE hens. <laughs> And they both flew to the log. They nest in these palm logs, which I had to have 
shipped up to me because they will not breed in a box. You have to breed it in a hollowed out palm log. So huge expense there. And I peeked in there and they had two babies. I didn't even know they had eggs. And so um, those two babies are pictured there. They look filthy because I had just pulled them out of the nest at that point. And they're always really, really disgusting when, when you pull them out. Um, they're well fed. Yeah, very well fed. Um, and so I, I then had uh, five pairs and they were all producing. I even had a pair that would foster. Um, she, the, the female had a damaged beak. She was at a zoo um, where she had escaped, flew into a macaw enclosure, got bit, and you know her beak was damaged. So I paired her with a male who fell in love with her. They just got along really, really well. And she, she fostered anything I put under her, any of the other Arasari. So I had a lot of success. Um, and you know, once again, no mentors. I reached out to a toucan breeder um, who many said was you know um, a good person to reach out to. And he told me I should just get stuffed toucans um, or toucan um, trinkets <laughs> to put on a shelf um, instead of actually getting into birds. Um, didn't even give me the time of day. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, from that point on, I'm like, I'm determined to, you know, to figure this out. And I did. Um, and then, you know, I continued on to get my, my master. I have two master's degrees. Uh, my second master's degree is in biology with a zoo and aquarium science twist um, a specialty. And so I started working as a zoo consultant and that connected me with zoos so that I could get birds from zoos as well for my program. Um, not penguins like the one pictured there. Um, I would never have penguins. They stink terribly and they have yeah. pretty poor <laughs> attitudes. But, um, you know, getting, working with zoos, learning from them, um, them learning from me was the great synergy um, that I still have today. And, um, Basically, it just uh, kind of bloomed into more education with like Bilbo here is, was one of my curl crested arsaris um, and, you know, bringing them to public events and getting kids excited about them was such a thrill for me. Um, and, you know, just seeing kids make a connection with any living thing mm -hmm. is probably the one spark that's going to get them to appreciate nature later. Um, mm -hmm. taking animals away from kids altogether is one of the most devastating things I can imagine. It doesn't, uh, they don't appreciate science. They don't appreciate wildlife and nature and conservation. Um, they need to have some of these, um, interactions. So that's, that's where I'm at today. Um, I have, um, an I have a main aviary that has fruit doves, which I've wanted forever, but it took me a few decades to work up to that, um, to be in an environment where I could have them. So I have two species of fruit doves. I have taracos, um, swamp hens, tanagers, um, and of course I'm still breeding our asaris, um, and some other things that I have in uh, beautiful outdoor enclosures that uh, I worked really, really hard throughout my career to, to finally um, come to fruition. So that's my story. <laughs> So, um, I guess how, how, so i I'm kind of interested in, uh, Turacos. Are they, is it depending on the species that the, you know, they're difficult to breed or work with as far as, um, uh, getting them to, you know, even rare species to reproduce? Yeah. Some, some of the rarer species, um, one of the breeders here in Florida, um, has some of the great blues and you know mm -hmm. the, when I met them the first time they said we we need to talk diet with you like we need to start experimenting with some other things because they're having a really tough time breeding them and yeah. it's not the environment the environment is beautiful they have nice big spacious aviaries and all that sort of thing but something something isn't right so you know experimenting mm -hmm. with diet is usually one of the first things diet and you know type the type of nesting um, set up right. is, is always uh, a place to start but mm -hmm. some of the other some of the others um, I mean when I was younger working for the pet shops I remember going to the quarantine station and you could just pick these birds up very cheap um, mm -hmm. mainly they were imports you know from from Africa and, and South America and um, you know uh, the 
the mouse birds that I that I used to breed, um, and it's killing me that I can't get mouse birds now because they're <laughs> phenomenal pets. They're phenomenal to breed and interact with. They're just really, really neat birds, but we can't we can't get new blood, mm-hmm. and it's it's really difficult. So, the, but the Taracos, um, different species have their have their different uh, different you know, issues yeah. come with them, yeah. And and we're still trying right. to figure out what some of those are. Yeah, yeah, and and you know, to your point about um, when you reached out to that person who was breeding two cans and um didn't give you the time of day and you said that 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 made you even more determined to go out there Mm -hmm. and just you know just go for it um that's really what drives us is when especially me when somebody tells me i cannot do something or just give up now (laughs) you know screw you i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna do what i want to do yes you know there's there's two types of people and i see this in my students all the time um, especially at the university, there's there's those that give up very easily and um, have a defeatist attitude. And then there's others who um, are like, no, I, I'm going to I'm going to push through and I'm going to do this. Right. And, right. you know, we, we, we tell students all the time, especially if they want to go to professional school. I have students that want to go to vet school or medical school. And I tell, they're like, what class do I need? What do I need? What, what should I have? Who should I have a rec- letter of recommendation from? I'm like, you need resilience. Right. <laughs> that's what you need. You need to not give up every time an obstacle is put before you because that's life. Life is just yeah. about that. And, um, you know, I knew that I wanted to work in exotics. I, after being, after being in the zoo world, I didn't want to work in a zoo as a, as a keeper or a curator, I wanted to mm-hmm. kind of call my own shots, but still right. be there as a resource. And that's what I made happen through my education because I pursued it myself. Um, and I I always tell people like, the best thing you can do is ask questions. What's the mm-hmm. worst that someone's gonna say? No, so then you ask somebody else and you just keep asking right. and you keep asking those questions. Um, right, You know, right. I, wouldn't have, I wouldn't have experienced DNA sexing birds in a lab if I didn't ask the geneticist one day, hey, can I come in and shadow you and, and, and watch you work? And then that mm-hmm. turned into something where I was there every week and it, it turned into a, a friendship and, and a, uh, a professional relationship that I still have today. So, right. you know, it's, you really have to pave your own way. No one's going to do it for you. <laughs> oh, I mean, I think, I think it's pretty clear, like from listening to everybody that no one here was just handed anything <laughs> that they have. Like we all worked for it. It was all something I know. I mean, I know I started over when I came to Florida. I'm sure Jason, in some ways you started over when you came to Florida too. Yep. Like I, I started from scratch. I started from nothing. And it was for me, I, I didn't see it as an obstacle. I saw it as like an exciting opportunity for change and for growth. And what can I do differently now? You know, now I'm, I'm starting anew, so I can, I can choose do I want to continue with working with the finches or do I want to branch out? And I chose to branch out. I said, you know, I, I felt that not that the Glutian finches were done for me, but that where I was, like where I'm located regionally, we don't have the same kinds of clubs and shows that they do in the Northeast. I mean, the Northeast is very intense when it comes to showing canaries, showing finches, showing parrots, like it's a big deal up there. And down here, it's just not a thing. So I kind of quickly realized that my goals and my ambitions and everything had to kind of change to suit where I was now. And I, I just branched out and I did something different. And I I think it was for the best. I think I, I learned something that I, like, I fell in love with a new species that I had never really had mm-hmm. any interaction with and that opened up the door for newer species so for the kakarikis and then for the sierras and you know now the red realms i i just feel like i'm i'm learning and being exposed to new things all the time as a result of challenges really oh yeah absolutely 
And I think yeah. I think keeping yes. keeping birds for me is what led to me wanting to learn more and getting mm -hmm. degrees and teaching others like and being responsible. I mean, all of my birthday money and Christmas money went to the birds. My parents didn't even have to ask. They knew mm -hmm. that <laughs> we were going to take that money and I was going to go buy a nest box and a brand new preview <laughs> Hendrix cage from the local pet shop, um, you know, because I was always like, I want to get something bigger for my birds. I want to feed them better. I want to feed them mm -hmm. different, more different things. I want to you know, give them a, give them a nest and start watching what they do, you know, th those types of things. And, um, you know, that's what, I think that is what taught me to be responsible, a lifelong learner and, um, you know, communicate with people the way that I do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Which kind of brings us to the final topic tonight. <laughs> the top five considerations for bird ownership. We talked a lot about a lot of this already, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, we've, we've already mentioned a number of these things because these are all things that come with the territory. Um, you know, and finances, people see as an obstacle often. If a 12-year-old like me can successfully breed cockatiels, growing up in a poor home, no money, we, we had no resources, um, I, I did it myself because it was something I was driven to do. Um, anybody can. <laughs> I'm sure we all started in different places, but uh, mm -hmm. you know, making sure that you have uh, the resources to keep keep the birds that you want. Um, well, I kind of want to take a step back because I think, like, what when we kind of approached this topic, we were thinking of it as many times when when a conversation is held about owning birds, whether it's for uh, pet ownership or for a breeder perspective, um, you know, the, the topic immediately comes to the species of the bird. Mm -hmm. And I don't always think that that's the, the first thing that you should focus on, because if I'm talking about as a pet, you know, what's appropriate for me could be completely different from what could be the best or most appropriate choice for someone like Jordan or someone like Lisa. It really is so circumstantial to what your life is. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, I kind of wanted to approach this from the top five considerations for bird ownership in general, whether it's mm -hmm. breeding or whether it's owning them as a pet. And I, you know, kind of felt like finances was the number one thing just because, um, a logistical standpoint, if I want to breed hyacinth macaws or black palm cockatoos, obviously I would have to have the capital necessary yes. to invest <laughs> in those birds first. Yes, right. And but you can if, always start somewhere, right? Right. Like, so you can if always I'm start say, well, I don't have 50 grand, so I quit. Like I could start how I have, you know, I could start with with Kakari geese, with Sierras, you know, you build a portfolio. So you develop a reputation, you work on your know-how and your knowledge and everything like that. It doesn't necessarily stop you from acquiring those species eventually, but maybe it's not something that you can start off right away with. But I do think that finances is the number one thing that you would look at, even with bird ownership as a pet or a companion standpoint. Um, you know, if you, if you're not committed and willing to be taking a bird for annual checkups, blood work, pathology, maybe a large bird isn't for you, but maybe something like a parakeet or a love bird, which could probably go with like an annual checkup and then bringing to the vet if there was an, you know, an accident or something that happened would be sustainable, um, so that was kind of my my process when when I put finances as the top one, and then um, I don't know if you guys have any other input with that, like finances in terms of diet, especially. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, or yeah, like with the Lori raising finches. Sure, Jordan, like are, you know, yeah, <laughs> but raising finches yeah. and things like that are are that's that's a pretty cheap thing. It doesn't mean you're cutting corners. They just don't have the hugely varied needs 
of mm -hmm. um, some of the larger birds like, yeah, like the lorries. Well, and they eat far less. So yeah. an investment in food goes a long way compared to something like a kakariki that eats like a chicken and you have to be prepared for them to literally eat you into financial ruin because they're going to scratch everything <laughs> out <laughs> and eat 10% of what you give to them. Yeah, exactly. You know. Well, in cages, I mean, a bigger bird's going to need a bigger and yes. more expensive cage. The bigger the perches are, the more expensive they are. Um, mm -hmm. And toys destructiveness. So if you're looking mm -hmm. into something like a cockatoo or a macaw, your cost for toys is going to be exponentially higher than like a budgie or a lovebird or even a parrotlet. I mean, my parrotlets are destructive, but <laughs> not anything like... Um, I had a Gotham's cockatoo, so not nothing like he was. Right. Yeah, you're going <clears> to, <throat> with the price of <laughs> lumber these days. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> just going over to Home Depot and getting some wood and slicing it up and drilling. It's not cheap. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. So then this, the, the second thing that I had noted was space. So not just the space of the cage itself, but where you are what your living situation is. Are you in an apartment? Are you in a full family house? Are you in a duplex? Do you have room to be able to have sort of an outdoor enclosure if you're having something like a lorry or a lorikeet? Um, and that, that's not just for mess, but that's also for noise. So, mm -hmm. you know, I think, I think if you're looking at something like a larger bird and you're in, a, in an apartment where you've got walls that don't have very good soundproofing between them or a duplex where you have a family with a young child sleeping and you've got a screaming macaw right. next door you know my my even my situation my my very first house that I purchased was a, a single family home but I was in an HOA controlled neighborhood and I had green sheet conyers on all and I and I had enough people complain that the HOA told me they're inside or they're gone. You have to bring them inside. And they were so loud that for me personally, I said, I can't, I can't have them inside. Like that's the whole reason yeah. I have them on my lanai. They are so loud. And Conyers, I think, are one of those species that you see on these social media platforms like TikTok and Instagram, where you see these cute short snippets of them where their behavior is so cute and they're so lovable and they're so affectionate. And all you hear is a little, the little growls that they make and you don't hear those flock calling screams that they do <laughs> at sunrise and sundown. And, you know, that for me, I, I said, I, well, they got to go, you know, I got, I got to transition them. And it wasn't a, I have to get rid of them thing. It was more like, I need to move in a different direction. So, you know, who, who, and, Who's working with these that's willing to take them and then maybe give me something in exchange? Yeah. Yeah. In in um even even for breeders, you know, your space outside, how how close are your neighbors? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, you, you can I'm lucky enough to be out in the country, but people can still complain if they wanted to. You know, they can't really do anything about it, but um, before I moved out here, I was actually in a residential area and I kept, I was so lucky to have neighbors that loved my lorries. So, um, <laughs> they, they didn't care. Um, and they were very loud at times and I kept them all at one end of the yard. It wasn't a super small backyard or anything. It, it, it was a good size. Um, but you know, a lot of that definitely needs to be taken into consideration. Um, as far as the species goes, there's some species of lorries that are not, you know, I wouldn't consider to be annoying. And then there are some uh, like yellow streaks and black lorries that are just, they, they let out these loud shrills that can just really tear into your eardrum, you know, um, especially when they're in a flock setting. So, yeah, I can only imagine, uh, you know, a bunch of Patagonian conures going off at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Just come to my house. <laughs> yeah. Right in the middle of the night. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that that's something that people, um, 
need to consider not just for neighbors, but for themselves as well, you know? Yeah, what, yeah. What kind of noise are you gonna be able to stand? And, you know, what pitch, what sounds? Chances mm -hmm. are they're not gonna talk, they're gonna make a really annoying sound. So are you gonna be able to handle that if they don't talk and that's what they do? Yeah, exactly. Uh -huh. Yeah, so then we also noted time. So not just the time with the bird. Um, I mean, obviously if you're looking into purchasing a bird as a pet, you're looking forward to that time that you're spending one-on-one -on -one with them, the cute interactions, the fun time that you're spending with them where you're getting that affection. But there's also time dedicated to care and also time dedicated to interaction with the bird that doesn't necessarily seem fun for you. So if you're working with a mm -hmm. bird that has issues with stepping up or biting, you have to actually be doing training. You have to be working with that bird. You have to be doing things with the bird that maybe you don't find engaging, but are engaging for the bird. And also time dedicated to care. I spent, I don't even know how many hours today cleaning and I had the help of somebody else. So um, mm -hmm. my mom was here helping me clean my entire bird room. So the time dedicated to care food prep. Um, I usually do all my chop on Sunday evenings. I'm like, where's my clock at? I don't know what time it is now. <laughs> So I typically do chop on Sunday evenings and, um, you know, mixing everything together, cleaning everything and cleaning is a daily thing. I think that, you know, that that's a piece of advice that I could give is that if you do one small thing of cleaning every single day, then it doesn't feel so much when you have to do as a breeder, it doesn't feel like it's so much when you have to do a big day like today, it still was a lot, but um, you know, wiping down things or cleaning the food dishes and the food bowls every single day when you pull them out it makes it a little less burdensome, but it's still a lot of work. Yeah. And you can, right. and you can totally keep your birds on a really great diet, a, a you know, a, a really diverse diet. Um, once you have a kind of a process down, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I tell people all the time, I, I'm a, I'm big on sprouting. I think, you know, most birds that we're keeping could definitely benefit from sprouts. Um, and it's, it's literally minutes a day to, to prep those. It's not difficult. And, um, and you're giving, and you're giving your birds, even just soaking some things, certain things that you can just soak overnight and feed the next day. Like you're already giving them a better diet than what they were probably on before. So, you know, even though it's time, it doesn't have to be a huge amount of time to still do it well, mm -hmm. you know, once you have a process. Yeah. And I think it's very important to really evaluate your end goal, especially as a breeder. Um, for someone who randomly wants a pair of hyacinth macaws or black uh, palm cockatoos, you know, are you going to have that time that it takes to dedicate to them as far as hand rearing or, um, you know, if, if uh, something goes wrong, like as far as a bird getting sick, um, do you have the time to just, and even diet, you know, preparing that, you guys just mentioned diet, you know, I feed my birds twice a day because they're lorries, they, they need wet food. Um, and I, I trade a lot of, of my free time in, you know, in order to take care of everything, there's times where I can't go on vacation or I can't take a weekend trip because I have to take care of everything. <laughs> so, yep. you know, if, if you're dedicated enough to it, um, there's going to be half, there's going to have to be some sacrifices made. Absolutely. Yeah. And we'll you probably yeah. cover this in a, not, we'll probably cover this in another episode, but you know, with mm -hmm. me time, time is growing food. Like I have the luxury of being in Florida where I can grow stuff outside most of the year, but you can also do some of these things in your home or in a garden bed or something like that. But, you know, growing edible flowers for my birds is really important. I see the enrichment that they get from those things. And so, mm -hmm. you know, that, that takes time to make sure that, you know, I'm growing fruit, I'm growing flowers and, and veggies and stuff like that. So, you know, it really depends on your level of commitment, whether you want to go buy those things or grow them yourselves. Either way, you're spending time or money. 
Um, so mm -hmm. you just have to make those choices. Yeah. We can um, jump down into the species consideration. So from a pet, pet perspective, I think this is pretty easy to cover. And Lisa, I'm sure you have a lot more to talk about when it comes to this than, um, you know, I'm myself or, you know, others might have. But for breeding, I think species consideration goes back to space, finances, and time. I think it's all inclusive. Um, it also um, incorporates the patient's aspect, which is the last part. But, you know, as a pet, I think there is the importance of considering the species that you're looking at because there are species that are just by nature a little bit more difficult and more intensive and more um, complicated when it comes to ownership. So I think you probably could speak on this a little bit more, seeing as you know, you've seen the rehoming and, um, you know, you've seen that side of it. Mm -hmm. Well, I would definitely say don't start out with Amazons and cockatoos. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, I see that all the time with people wanting to start out with cockatoos because they're cuddly and, you know, they're Velcro birds. And um, those are the number one species that you see going in. To rescues because people just aren't prepared for the noise. They're not prepared for them biting when they don't get what they need. Um, mm -hmm. You know, same with Amazons. Um, Amazons aren't necessarily cuddly, but you know, they're big birds. They have very strong uh, jaw muscles and they bite hard. And uh, that's probably the species more than any other that you're going to see in a cage covered with a blanket in a back bedroom. Because, you know, the Amazons. A, yeah, because yeah. they're mean. You know, you can't, you can't hold them. You can't do this because people don't understand that, uh, you know, they're, the Amazons are not typically birds that you're going to want your, you know, all of your kids playing with. They're not, they're not family birds. They can be. I mean, you know, there's exceptions to all species, but in general, um, again, that's a bird people want because they talk well. So, uh, yeah, you know, I, I think that cockatiels, um, make great, I mean, they're great birds. They're friendly, they're affectionate, they're smart, they're they funny. can talk. Yeah. 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 I mean, and lovebirds too. Um, you know, female lovebirds, mm, you know, but <laughs> it, <laughs> the males are darling. I mean, we have this scraggly little male peach face who has, and I always forget what it's called. Jason's going to probably know, but it's some kind of, it's almost like eczema. He gets it under his wings and on his back and he has, we have to get cream for him and now he's got some weird head tilt, so he walks weird. But he's so <laughs> sweet. And people will come over, they will see all the awesome birds we have, and then all they want to do is play with Newton because he's so freaking cute and friendly. You know? <laughs> I don't care about any of the other birds. So yeah. I think that they make really great companions too. And we started out with a cockatiel and a Quaker, and I think Quakers make their... They're a big parrot in a small package. They talk well. They're sm mm -hmm. super smart. Um, I think they make really good first pets too, but you know, there's an exception for everything too, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, these are definitely good things to consider before uh, getting a bird, if you're looking into getting one. Um, you know, ask yourself, is this the right fit for me? Is this the right species? Um, do whatever you have to do to look into them, ask whoever's working with them about their vocal range, about their needs, dietary needs. Um, you know, we certainly, I as a breeder certainly don't want to place a bird somewhere where they're just going to be um, placed somewhere else or given up on. And I'm always willing to take birds back, but, you know, I just want to make sure I'm doing what I can as a breeder to, you know, let said person know um, do you know what you're getting into? Because lorries are not for everyone. Well, and I think that's an important thing to consider too, if you're reaching out to a breeder directly, because I have a lot of people contact me and ask me the difference between owning a parrotlet versus owning a Capriki. And they're very different birds. And parrotlets, 
are kind of like miniature Amazons. They're Napoleon complexes and a very small body. Um, so I, I, so I typically, true. like I typically say they're not good for small children. Um, small children have a tendency to, if a, if a bird is going to bite them, they're going to shake their hand violently and they're going to fling that bird and it's going to slam into a wall. So not good. Kakarikis are very much like Indian ringneck where they don't want to be touched. So yes, they're inquisitive. They're very curious. They're very um, interactive in their behavior. They want to be on you, around you, but they don't want you to touch them. So they're not cuddly. They're not affectionate birds. And I get this a lot where they've come to me and they've said, oh, that's not what someone else has told me. And it, it just makes me a little bit sad because I feel like it's doing a, a big disservice to the bird. It's going to that bird is going to wind up in a home where this person is then disappointed because they're not mm -hmm. getting what they're expecting. And even with parrotlets, like I, I feel as though, yes, they do have a very feisty personality, but I also feel like they have a genuinely bad rep. I think if they're socialized and, and raised correctly from the beginning, they have the um, foundation to be, a good companion and a good first bird, but they do need someone who can effectively establish boundaries and someone who is willing to take on a bird that doesn't just want to be taken out of the cage and pet and then put back. Like a bird that wants engagement, a bird that craves um, training tricks. They're so good at learning tricks and you know, interaction that, that's not just, I, I just want a bird that I can scritch. And I think that that goes for any species. Like, I think that that, that shouldn't be your only goal. I mean, you should want to enrich their lives in ways other than just touching them. But mm -hmm. well, again, and, and often, like, I mean, you've all heard if it's too good to be true, it probably is. Yes. And, mm -hmm. you know, if you're working, you know, if you're talking to someone about getting a bird and they're giving you all the answers you want to hear, probably not someone you want to be working with. If you're working with someone who's going to give you the hard truth, that's probably who you need to be working with. Because, the mm -hmm. you know, the, the truth is never perfect. You're not going to find the perfect bird because what you put into it as the as the bird owner mm -hmm. um or the, the breeder is what you're gonna get out of it. And so, you know, um, when I tell people, like if someone takes home a bird, um, one of my Arsaris, for example, is a pet. I often hear people say, oh, this bird was so friendly. It came right out to me. And I'm like, well, why is that surprising? And they're like, oh, well, cause every bird I've ever got out, they told me to leave it alone for a few days and not touch it. And, you know, and I'm like, that's, <laughs> That's that's ridiculous. If it's raised correctly, you know, you, you should be getting what you want. But you have to put just as much work into it as who you got it from. And that involves mm -hmm. training and, and understanding that you're training the bird even when you don't think you're training the bird. You're reinforcing things. If the bird's screaming and you look in its direction, you just reinforce the behavior. That's really hard to get out, right, to breed mm -hmm. out, to, to get out of that bird. So... Um, you know, the, the last, the last piece, the last piece here that we have listed is patience. And, you know, that goes for breeding birds or, you know, working with a brand new species or, you know, getting a pet, whether it's a first bird or your 12th bird, it doesn't matter. You still need patience and time and, you know, um, the right environment for that bird. Um, and that's where talking to people like us or, you know, other other breeders or, you know, whoever, whoever your resources are, um, come in to play. Yep. Yeah. It takes a village, right? <laughs> it's a village. <laughs> but that is, this has been fun. Um, I appreciate all of your expertise. I learned some things tonight and I, I love that. So, um, we can and sign Thank off. you for sharing your, thank you for sharing your stories too. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Love, love hearing people's stories. I think that was my favorite <laughs> part of tonight. Yeah, same.
So uh, this will we'll we'll, uh, we'll sign off for tonight, and um, we'll see you on our next Until episode. Until next time. Next time. All righty. All right. Bye. Bye.